इवन मेक मी हो Anishan, you can start now. Good evening, uh, participants. Thank you for joining uh, Shield Connect. So today we have a uh, ma'am from Bangalore uh, who will give uh, or who will talk on the uh, thin endometrium. Uh, the speaker uh, for the day is uh, Dr. Rekha Rajendra Kumar. And so uh, let me give an uh, introduction of ma'am. Uh, ma'am is uh, MBBS, uh, MD, DNB. and uh, has done a fellow reproductive medic medicine and ma'am is medical director in uh, miracle ivf hospital and chandana hospital in bangalore ma'am is gynecologist and ivf specialist uh, ma'am has done a diploma in health and hospital management and diploma in human resources development and in hospital administration uh, ma'am has received uh, various awards uh, like uh, Uh, ma'am is all india topper uh, in icog reproductive medicine ma uh, examination uh, ma'am uh, currently uh, is a uh, ma'am is practicing gynecologist for past 30 years and ma'am is a honorary uh, secretary of bsog from uh, 2020 to 2021 uh, ma'am is also part of south zone co uh, coordinator in foxy infertility committee uh, ma'am is chairperson of infertility and art committee of ks oga from 2020 to 2022 and ma'am uh, is also peer reviewer of jogi and uh, journal of uh, pharmaceutical research at international and uh, ma'am is also joint organizing secretary of abhigyan 2021 foxy figo saf og and bs og international conference Ma'am has uh, also published many uh, papers and uh, articles. One case report, nine original articles, and one poster presentation in Ashray conference uh, recently in 2021, and more than 60 radios and television talks and 30 newspaper articles. So, ma'am, uh, we welcome you on our platform. And uh, participants, you have any questions? You can uh, write on the comment section in the uh, page and uh, Shield Connect page, and we will have a Q and A. at the end with ma'am so ma'am i hand over the session to you and uh, welcome you on our platform thank you shield pharma thank you mr krishna for the generous uh, introduction of mine uh, without much ado i'll start with my presentation because it appears a quite a long presentation i request all the participants to mute themselves so that let all of us concentrate on the topic so let me proceed the topic i'm going to speak today is on am i audible yes ma'am yeah fine all right so that's on thin endometrium and about thin endometrium i am going to briefly touch upon certain non fertility aspects like the different ages the how the endometrium appears to be and also i'm going to sp speak on especially the fertility aspects because we are really worried about not only the quality of the embryo we are equally worried about the soil that is the endometrium that is the endometrium not flourishing ultimately Ultimately, that is the thin endometrium, which causes chunk of the problem, contributing to the fertility failures. Now, little bit physiology, what we used to read in our UG days, the human endometrium is a highly regenerative tissue. As all of you know, every month a new endometrium is formed. It is its regenerative potential is comparable to other tissues in the body, like bone marrow. the epidermis of the skin and the gut it goes through about 400 menstrual cycles of regeneration there is differentiation of the tissue and then during menstruation there is shedding of all this endometrium this all happens during the reproductive age of the woman say that is from puberty to menopause each month about 4 to 10 mm of the endometrium grows within 4 to 10 days in the proliferative proliferative phase so during the proliferative phase there is growth of the endometrium under the influence of increasing circulating estrogen levels estrogen is the key hormone that causes the endometrial growth endometrial thickness as well as proliferation 
the process of regeneration completes during menstruation itself. I know that one really gets surprised because of this statement of mine, but that is true and that is a fact that the process of regeneration completes during the four days of menstruation itself and the surface of the endometrium gets rapidly covered. That's why the woman stops bleeding. Because of this regenerative process, the bleeding stops because the tissues get sealed and the process is completed within 48 hours after the start of menstruation. The endometrium that is derived from the mucosal lining of the fused mullerian ducts. All of us know that the uterus is formed by fusing of the mullerian ducts in the center. So that mucosal lining is essential for the reproduction and it may be one of the most complex tissue in the human body because as I have already told in my previous slides, it is unique in its differentiation, regeneration, shedding, etc. because it is such an active tissue. It's always changing, responding to the cyclic patterns of the estrogen and progesterone of the ovarian as well as, as that is reflected by the menstrual cycle and to a complex interplay among its, all, its own autocrine and paracrine factors. So the endometrium is subjected to so many hormones in the body, not only the sexual hormones, even other hormones, say like a thyroid hormone. So it is dependent or it reflects the change of so many autocrine and paracrine factors in the body. And that is amazing. Endometrial thickness. Now let me talk a little bit of histology of endometrium because you will know the importance as I go, as I travel to my future slides. Why I'm talking of this slide is because look at that, the upper two third of the endometrium, the endometrium, if you divide into three portions, that is the thickness of the endometrium, upper two third, all of us know that we call it as a functionalis layer, because that is the active functioning layer, also that is called as a stratum compactum. The lower one third is a basalis layer. It is always there. The basalis layer remains there, but the functionalis layer is the one that regenerates, degenerates, sheds, and whatever. So the functionalis layer prepares for the implantation. That is the nice, soft bed for the embryo. That is the cradle for the embryo to sit. And therefore, it is the site of proliferation, degeneration, and regeneration. Now, what about the basalis layer? Basalis layer provides the regenerative endometrium. Basalis layer is the one that makes this functionalist layer. The functionalist layer starts from the basalis layer. So it provides the regeneration of the endometrium. It supplies the blood to the endometrium. I will talk about the blood supply in future slides anyway. So that following, the, uh, it provides the regenerative endometrium following the menstrual loss of the functionalis. What I, meant, what I mean to say is the functionalist layer gets shed at the end of each menstruation, but the basalis layer does not get shed. Basalis layer remains there and remains forever, and that gives the functionalis layer every time, and that causes the regeneration or the formation of the functionalis layer. The endometrial thickness is a co is commonly measured parameter on routine gynec ultrasound. As all of you know, is a transvaginal ultrasound is the tool that is our extended finger, as we say. And all of us do have the ultrasound, the transvaginal probe, as our one of our office acumen. And so the gynec ultrasound, that is the transvaginal one, is the one which is which we usually use. We use many times, very often, and this is very easy to do and it is the endometrial thickness is measured by not only the ultrasound, there are even other hi-fi investigations like MR imaging, that is a magnetic resonance imaging, etc. But most of the times we, don't, we do not need that and the routine 2D or maximum 3D ultrasound will suffice. The appearance as well as the thickness of the endometrium will depend on whether the patient is of the reproductive age. This is what I was telling. The age of the patient is the one that is important factor one would like to know when they assess the thickness of the endometrium. Like it is different at each age of the person whether the patient is on the reproductive age, the postmenopausal age, or in the reproductive bracket. So what age she belongs to is very, very important. And what point of the menstrual cycle? This is another important 
feedback or a factor one would like to know. So two things, what? One, the age of the woman. Two, what point of the, which day of the menstrual cycle she is in. So these are the two very important things one should know. Now, how should we measure this endometrium? Look at that. The endometrium should be measured in the long axis of the sagittal plane. The maximum distance between the echogenic surfaces of the interfaces of the endometrium and the myometrium. It is one point lies at the interface between the endometrium and the myometrium on one side. Then the cursor crosses the endometrial canal, goes to the other side, and there you again put a point which is again the interface of the endometrium and myometrium on the other side. Mind you, this is very important in the longitudinal plane or the sagittal plane where you see the full length of the uterus as well as the cervix. Otherwise, this has no meaning because you have to measure in the sagittal axis itself. The measurement is of the thickest echogenic area. You should measure the thickest point there from one basal endometrial intersurface to other basal endometrial surface. The care should be taken not to include the hypoechoic myometrium. This is what I was saying that the dot should lie at the interface between the endometrium and the myometrium. As I've already said, I just reiterate my statement that it varies, that, that is the thickness of the endometrium varies with age. Premenopausal, how this endometrium is. In premenopausal patients, there is a significant variation at different stages of the menstrual cycle. Like during menstruation, it is two to four mm because it's already shed. Early proliferative phase, it starts regenerating. Day six to 14, it starts building up. So four to eight mm in the late proliferative or the pre ovulatory Say I can call it as day 11, day 12. It will go up to 11 mm. When we do a follicular study, we see this endometrium. When we do the patient during the HRT cycles before the embryo transfer, we monitor this endometrium and these are the times we really watch this endometrium so well, including the thickness. Coming to the secretory phase, that is a post-ovulatory phase, it gets a little bit compacted under the influence of progesterone. And so that is around 7 to 16 mm. More than the thickness, we watch the texture or the appearance of the endometrium during the progesterone phase. So following dilatation and cure attach, of course, it is much thinner or after soon after the abortion or soon after the menstruation, etc. Since the endometrium is shed, that is the functional layer of the endometrium is shared, then the thickness of the endometrium also drops. So that is usually less than 5 millimeter. But if it is more than 5 millimeter, then that is soon after the dilatation, curatage or spontaneous ab abortion, one should consider the retained products of conception. Why this endometrium is not getting thinner? So especially with the background of patient having intermittent bleeding, one should consider the retained products of conception. Coming to the pediatric endometrium, it, I have already told that the topic I'm going to speak not only on the fertility issues, I'm also talking of the endometrium at non-fertility aspects also. So I'm talking about the pediatric endometrium here. At birth, if you are curious to know about the pediatric endometrium, isn't it? At birth, the uterus is similar in size to the cervix. So it's one is to one ratio. And the endometrium generally appears so thin, it's just like an ecogenic line, approximately one Fourth of the neonates will have the fluid collection within the endometrial cavity, maybe because of the maternal estrogenic effect. Once puberty is reached, the girl has grown bigger. She's come to the age of around 10 to 12. The appearance of the endometrium begins to approximate that is seen in the adulthood. So that starts becoming similar to the adult endometrium. And there that varies with the stage of the menstrual cycle, especially if she has already entered menarche. What is postmenopausal endometrium? It, it depends on whether or not there is a history of vaginal bleeding. If the woman, postmenopausal woman, does not have history of bleeding, we are quite happy with that. And on the use of hormonal therapy and tamoxifen, these are the factors we should know, especially if the woman has a thick endometrium or she has a history of vaginal bleeding, because I will elaborate further on what these things do matter. The homogeneous, smooth 
smooth endometrium measuring 5 millimeter or less. I reiterate my statement here. Look at that. It is 5 mm or less than 5 mm endometrium is what, what we expect, what we consider as normal in the postmenopausal woman. And that is a normal range without the hormone replacement therapy. If one is on tamoxifen, tamoxifen is the one that builds the endometrium. So we give a bit L a upper edge that is a, a bigger margin for the tamoxifen that is less than six millimeter in the postmenopausal woman. Like certain times of treatment of breast cancer, the woman can maybe on tamoxifen. We really don't know. So that time one has to ask about the question that whether you are on any drugs. These are the things that really matter. So although 50% of these receiving tamoxifen have been reported to have a thickness of sometimes surprisingly even 8 mm or more, that is really because of tamoxifen. So that history really matters. Now, what about the woman who is on hormone replacement therapy? In a patient who is undergoing hormone replacement therapy, it may vary up to 3 mm if the cyclic estrogen progesterone therapy is being used. That is the either COCs or it's an estrogen followed by the progesterone because the progesterone give, does the castration of the endometrium. It removes all the endometrium. So somewhere around 3 mm is quite okay with me. The endometrium will appear thickest prior to the progesterone exposure. That is because of the uh, unopposed estrogen action there and it is thinnest after the progesterone phase. Imaging should be performed at the beginning or the end of the cycle treatment when the endometrium will be at its thinnest that is soon after the progesterone withdrawal, bleeding, etc. And any pathological thickening will be most important. A patient that is more than 5 mm or even the after the complete menstruation, if the endometrium is more than 5 mm, persistent thickening of the endometrium or change in the architecture is not the smooth, thin endometrium. So these are the things that should alert you. A patient who is undergoing unopposed estrogen therapy with the endometrial thickening of more than 8 mm, that is the unopposed estrogen therapy, should be considered for biopsy, whereas the patients who are receiving progesterone in addition to estrogen, most of the times it is the estrogen followed by the sequential progesterone that is administered. So in these women, they can be rescanned at the beginning or end of the following cycle to determine if there has been a change in the endometrial thickness. Now, coming to the menstrual phase, during menstruation, that is while the woman is actively bleeding, the endometrium is very thin. It is 1 to 4 mm. Say like when we do a day two scan, the woman has come for IVF. I have started my scanning for the pickup on day two. So that time her endometrium, when I watch, it is a very thin line. As you can see in this figure, it's such a narrow, thin endometrium. You don't see the three layers. You don't see the triple line. It is just few millimeter of the endometrium and it never crosses more than 4 mm. Coming to the postmenstrual woman, once the menstrual bleeding stops, there is a short duration of about 48 hours when the endometrium rests and it repairs itself immediately. At this time, the endometrium is disorganized. It's not a nice thin endometrium. You don't feel, you don't see that continuous single thin line. It's disorganized and chaotic endometrium and only about one millimeter thick. The late proliferative phase that is uh, about to uh, around uh, ovulation time or just a pre-ovulatory phase, the endometrium develops a multi-layer. This is the time we are happy because this is the time we see that beautiful triple line endometrium. You can see in the picture one two and the third layer. So you have to measure from here, that is the interface to this interface. So this thickness is very, very important. And that is the trilaminar layer, whatever we call. So that happens during the periovulatory or rather just a pre-ovulatory phase. The endometrium develops a multi-layered appearance with an echogenic basal layer and the hypoechoic inner functional layer separated by a thin echogenic median line. This is the one arising from the the central interface or the luminal content. So that is the one. Coming to the next part of her menstrual cycle, the subsequent part is the secretory phase of the menstrual cycle. How does the secretory endometrium appear? In the secretory phase, it's at its thickest, it's a, a thick 
endometrium is, which is quite looks like a white thick endometrium because of its high ecogenicity that is because of the progesterone as the functional area becomes edematous and is echoic compared to the basal layer there is also Thorough transmission and posterior acoustic enhancement also may be seen because of the ecogenicity. Then the secretory endometrium, how do we measure? Again, we measure here. Most of the times, this is the non-fertility issues because, because we do not measure most of the times the secretory endometrium. It is the like, say, the postmenopausal woman, the woman on HR, HRT or the woman with the history of DUB. So these are the women where we have to check the endometrium. The secretory endometrium is demarcated between the two arrows. So these, this is the one I was telling about. The basal endometrium is no longer seen here. And this is that same the trilaminar layer is not seen it's one compact mass kind so only the ecogenic endometrium is measured here that is this so from this point to this point and this is that red line the surrounding sonolucent so all this part halo arrows that is all these kind of things so this is the sonolucent area that should not be included in the measurement because that really alters our thought process that will really alter our uh, way, the way we treat her. So it is the exact measurement of the endometrium that is very crucial. Coming to the late secretory phase, endometrial growth stops from the 22nd day of the cycle as the corpus luteum that is backing up is not there. Corpus luteum starts degenerating, her body starts getting prepared for the next menstrual so then it starts to shrink and then necrosis occurs with shedding of the endometrial lining and that is the heralding of the menstruation and thus starts the next menstrual cycle. So this is what I was telling about. This is just the ovarian picture. This is the uh, dominant follicle that is seen. Now, this is the menstrual phase of the endometrium. That is a thin line of the endometrium, periovulatory endometrium. This is what I was telling about that the beautiful endometrium. And look Look at the texture here and look at the texture here. It's not like this. This is the more of an estrogen dominant endometrium. This is more of a progesterone dominant secretory phase of the endometrium. Now, what to what to see when you scan? That is, two anatomical parameters have been suggested for the evaluation of the endometrium. I'm not talking about the uterus here. I'm not talking about the uterine architecture like myoma or adenomyosis, etc. I'm talking only about the endometrium. So, one look for the endometrial pattern, as I was telling it's a smooth thin line or it's a disrupted line etc and second thing is the endometrial thickness how thick the endometrium is so this is just the cross section that is the myometrium then basalis endometrium functionalis layer the uterine cavity etc just the pictorial diagram on that now what is the window of implantation this is a very specific term to all of us fertility specialists because we are really worried about this period because we don't want to miss this period in a woman because all of us know that this is the fertile period and this is the time for the embryo to get implanted and if you if the embryo gets implanted during this time the chances of pregnancy is much much more the preparation of the endometrium is directed towards the cycle phase <clears throat> of receptivity, which is known as window of implantation. Now, this is described, it's like a, just a window. The window shutter is open and the window shutter is closed. So it opens on day 19, that is the mid-luteal phase, and let's say around <clears throat> a week after the ovulation time and closes on day 24 when the implantation so it is the 19th to 24th day is the most conducive period for the embryo to come and sit there so there is an increased mitotic activity during this period there's an increased nuclear dna and cytoplasmic rna synthesis everything all are in the process of receiving that so precious blastocyst there and they want the they embrace the blastocyst so well and the endometrial <clears throat> the endometrial embryo talk will be so cordial during this period of window of implantation. How do we assess the window of implantation? Just by clinically or looking at the ultrasound, as I have already mentioned in the previous slides, or probably from day 19, if the menstrual cycles are so regular, to day 24. But there are HIFI investigations, the recent investigations. This is a new kid on the block. And this is what we call as the ERA test or the endometrial receptivity array. 
this is a test where we take a small chunk of the endometrium, send it for testing. And in the future month, that is a future cycle, we will know when to put that embryo there, when to put that blasto there. That is, it gives us the information which day is most perfect for her to receive the embryo. So that is what is error. Now the endometrial receptivity during the window of implantation depends upon what are all the factors. So it is the endometrial thickness that is very crucial factor. The pattern of the endometrium, as I've already told, the trilaminar pattern that is very, very important. Endometrial and subendometrial blood flow that, de de deter that is determined by our Doppler studies of the endometrial and the subendometrial area. And not to forget is the endometrial volume. So these are all the factors that can alter the endometrial receptivity and they are so crucial. How do we evaluate? So far I was talking about the thickness of the endometrium, the factors, etc. Coming to a little bit of the practical aspect of this endometrium, uh, how do you know that this endometrium is this thick? How do you know that this pattern is okay, etc. Is one is by the transvaginal sonography, then sonosalpingography, is most of the times used for not exactly the endometrium but for other pathology that's a space occupying lesion or the tubal patency histosalpingography again tells many things about the endometrium like it says about there is a submucous myoma there is a polyp or the uterine anomalies the septum and whatnot the hysteroscopy we see with our own eyes the office hysteroscopy hardly takes 10 minutes without anesthesia you see with directly inside the inspect the endometrial cavity and send the woman home. So you come to know so many issues while you do the hysteroscopy. The histological examination of the endometrial biopsy, we do not do until and unless we suspect a real pathology, say like tuberculosis of the endometrium, malignancy of the endometrium, etc. Otherwise, most of the times the histopathological examination of the endometrium is not done. What we used to say like Novak's criteria to determine the endometrial dating, etc. has taken back seat, they're almost obsolete now. So we do by most of the times, one, transvaginal sonography, number two, hysterosalpingography, and three, hysteroscopy. These are the three important pillars of endometrial evaluation. And probably around 95 to almost 99% of the information we do get if the woman undergoes these three investigations. The evaluation of the endometrial pattern thickness and the blood flow is done by ultrasonography, not only the 2D, 3D, it will be supplemented or added information will be given lot of information by the color Doppler. I will just enumerate about the color Doppler in my coming slides. Patients with a thin endometrium also merit a hysteroscopy. Most of the times pre IVF we do hysteroscopy and say around it is known by studies that in an order, around 10 to 25 percent of the women you do find something abnormal inside the uterine cavity so pre-IVF hysteroscopy is not a waste according to me so it is very much necessary if it was not done before let the woman undergo one small hysteroscopy she will not lose anything because it is most of the time 2.93 mm scope of hysteroscopy without any uterine dilatation, hardly any pain and no admission, no anesthesia. Now coming about coming to the Doppler studies, the Doppler blood flow of the endometrium is very, very important. The Doppler measures the endometrial blood flow because not only the architecture or the appearance or the thickness of the endometrium is not the only thing. The very important or the very, very crucial thing is the endometrial blood flow. How much of the blood supply the endometrium endometrium is receiving because the endometrial thickness is directly proportional to the blood that is flowing to the endometrium. If there is no blood flow or if there is hardly any blood flow, definitely the endometrium will not regenerate. There will be no uh, fluffy endometrium. So the endometrial thickness is, uh, we are not so happy with the endometrial thickness. Hysteroscopy may reveal intrauterine additions, endometrial polyp, fibrosis, etc. whatever I mentioned previously, the silent 
patient endometritis sometimes is shown just as a hyperemia or a very small micro polyps there. Intrauterine addition is found in about 8 to 10 percent of the women with the recurrent implantation failure. So the evidence suggests that hysteroscopic removal of these additions and followed by the estrogen supplementation is very necessary for next three months and that improves the fertility outcome in these women. Why we are so worried, why are we so much bothered about this endometrial thickness with our infertility patients? Because it is directly proportional to the pregnancy rate. A number of researchers have proved that thickness of pre-implantation endometrium is directly related to the positive pregnancy outcome. Pregnancy rate was found to be highest among the group who had trilaminar endometrium. I was telling that it is a beautiful endometrium one would like to see. So that is you should that usually comes when the endometrium is around 8 to 12, 13 mm thickness and no pregnancy when the thickness is less than 7 millimeter. So that if you measure the thickness alone, you come to know many factors. You can really prognosticate about her pregnancy. Dickey and colleagues in way back in 93 found no pregnancy if the thickness of the endometrium was 7 mm or less. So that is really bad. Pregnancy rate at the same time was higher, that is 12% compared to the previous 8 person in the trilaminar versus non-trilaminar group. So with the trilaminar, it was 12%. In the non-trilaminar, it was 8%. And even higher at 39% when the endometrium is both, that is the thickness was more than 6 mm. In this study, it was 6 mm, but it practically, it is always more than 7, 8 mm associated with the trilaminar texture. So that is the thickness of the endometrium being more than 7 mm, say around 8 plus mm of endometrium with the trilaminar appearance really gives a better pregnancy rate. So an endometrial thickness of 9 to 14 mm, that's very optimum, is associated with the higher implantation and pregnancy rates as compared to thickness less than 7 mm. It's nothing new compared to my previous slide. Look at that, that was 12% and that was 19%. That is just the endometrial thickness. Blue is when it was less than 7 and purple was when it was was more than nine. So with endometrium being better, everything is better. Implantation, pregnancy, ongoing pregnancy, LVR, everything is much better. So this is one of the so important crucial key factors, isn't it? So now coming to the endometrial thickness by ultrasound. While the benefit of ultrasound to characterize the follicular development is well documented, its value in the endometrial evaluation is less clear. Like the, it may not be exactly related to the pathology, especially when it is abnormal. Endometrial thickness is directly correlated to increasing circulating estrogen. Yes, of course, estrogen is the hormone that feeds the endometrium and that is the one that is directly causes the thickening of the endometrium. Endometrial thickness is related to the endometrial receptivity and can be predictor of success in assisted reproduction technology. Just wanted to show certain studies. So the, all the facts, whatever I mentioned, were based on these studies. So I have just put these slides. In 10% cases, the idea image for the measurement is difficult to obtain due to the presence of fibroids, some pathology in the uterine cavity, or sometimes if the body habitus was not so conducive for examination, previous surgeries, patient was just not ready, etc. So that it was difficult in 10% of the cases. Now coming to the to my topic per se, so what is thin endometrium? How thin is actually thin? To date, there is currently no agreement on the optimum endometrial thickness cutoff because many studies have shown, look at the bottom statement, that many studies have shown around even 5 mm to 15 mm, that is less than 5 and more than 15 that pregnancies can happen. But that is not the end of all. It states that it can happen, but the chances of pregnancy are so dismal when the endometrial thickness is less than 5 or more than 15 mm, it is so well optimum if it is between 8 
18 to 14 mm only. Now, more than 1,200 mm, that's a large volume study, 1,200 embryo transfers with an endometrial thickness below 7 mm. So, that was from the JLH hands, it was a study, and he did on 1,200 embryo transfers and below 7 mm. What did he conclude? He said clinical pregnancy and LBR decrease for each millimeter of endometrial thickness below 8 mm. Please understand and take this point in your mind. Each thick, each millimeter, because when we do HRT cycle in these women, <clears throat> each mm increases the rate of pregnancy. Suppose she's 7 mm, don't be in a hurry to transfer the embryo. Take her somewhere more than 9 mm and that really matters. So the live birth rate decreased with each millimeter of endometrial thickness below 8 mm in fresh IVF cycles. <clears throat> and below 7 mm for the FET cycles. But in my practice, I always take it more than 8 to 9 mm, even if it is a FET cycle. Nevertheless, viable pregnancy rates remain reasonably acceptable in patients with an endometrial thickness between 4 to 6 mm. Sometimes it may happen. <clears throat> now, this is just uh, all things in summary. It is look at that. If the endometrium is less than 6 mm and 6 to mm, uh, 6 to 8 mm, look at the endometrial thickness being that the pregnancy rate is less than 15%, and that is very sorry figure. But if the same endometrium is grown to 8 to 10 mm, look at that. That is around almost 55. That's a real leap. So it really matters. So the endometrial thickness should be optimum, should be 8 to 10 mm, or say it's somewhere around these two. That's around 8 to 12 mm should be quite fine. The impact of a thin endometrial lining on the fresh and frozen thaw IVF cycles was done on more than 40,000 embryo transfer cycles. They said the viable pregnancy rates remain reasonably acceptable in patients with an endometrial thickness between 4 to 6 mm. What I wanted to say here is that there are so many other kind of studies also, but the take home point would be that it has to be between 8 to 12 or 8 to 13 mm. The patients who conceive on thin endometrium, why we are so much bothered about endometrial thickness, why are we so much bothered that even if the, uh, the woman does not conceive and even if she conceives, that is not end of all, that is not the end of problem. Why? Because patients who conceive on thin endometrium do carry their stories forward, do, do have problems even further. It may continue even after the birth of the baby. So it, look at that, it has so much of impact, the gravity of situation is so much that it still continues even after the birth of the baby. Why? Because the patients who conceive on thin endometrium have a significantly increased risk of early pregnancy loss. The obstetric journey is not so smooth. So there is a chance of pregnancy loss either in the form of miscarriage in the early trimesters or even ectopics can happen because the endometrial cavity is not so conducive for that embryo. These patients also have a two-fold increase in the risk of low birth weight, intrauterine growth retardation, preterm labor, and adverse perinatal outcome because the LBW and IUG are definitely are going to cause the adverse perinatal outcomes. Now, what are the factors affecting the endometrial health? The, seed, the endometrial thickness, texture, whatever I was mentioning is affected because of these things. One, the serum estradiol levels, the circulating estradiol level around that endometrium the endometrial and subendometrial vascularity is the second thing. And third is the histology of the endometrium itself. How healthy that endometrial tissue is. Sometimes it's really affected by the injury or infection, which I will describe in my next slides. The incidence of thin endometrium in ovarian stimulation cycles, all the ovarian stimulation cycles, say like it's ICSI, IVF, IUI, monofollicular growth, whatever you think the uh, mild stimulation cycles, etc., is around 38 to 66 percent. And that, that's quite a huge chunk of thin endometrium. Coming to IVF cycles per se, it's around 1 to 2.5 percent. That is based on so many observational studies. Takasaki, he is one input. This person has done a lot of study on the endometrial blood flow. He 
the Takasak et al. group, it reported that thin endometrium is due to high blood flow impedance of the uterine radial arteries. I will show you in my next slide where the uterine radial artery lies. So the uterine blood flow is an important factor for the endometrial growth, but the blood flow is, there is impedance for this blood flow. According to this study, high blood flow impedance of the uterine radial artery impairs the growth of the glandular epithelium and that results in decrease in the vascular endothelial growth factor. We keep talking about this vascular endothelial growth factor, which in turn causes the poor flow to the endometrium. That's a key factor. Vascular endothelial growth factor is the key factor that helps in the growth of the endometrium. Decreased blood flow is associated with the decreased endometrial growth. Yes, that is common sense. It's measured by the resistance index and the pulsatility index in the radial artery of of the uterus in the late follicular phase. Now, this is what I was talking about. The blood supply to the endometrium and the endometrial thickness is that, look at that, that's an important ovarian artery. Then these are the branches that they come. Then this is the arcuate artery. This is the radial artery. And these are the different other kind of basal arteries. That is this part is the sphinx part is the myometrium. The sphinx part is the myometrium and this yellow part is the basal endometrium, the endometrium rather. So this is the basal and these coiled ones are the spiral arteries. So this Y yellow is the endometrium and this is the myometrium. So these are the branches that the uterine artery that come from as the branches and then that is the arcuate artery and this is the radial artery I was talking about. The impedance is in the radial artery and that further reduces the blood flow and supply to this endometrium. So the thin endometrium is characterized by high flow impedance of the uterine radial artery that is there. Then poor epithelial growth, decreased expression of VGEF and poor vascular development, which are subsequent to that. The color flow Doppler of the endometrium and the uterine arteries have been extensively studied by Steer et al. And they have found that no pregnancy occurred if the pulsatility, pulsatility index of the uterine artery was more than four and there was no spiral artery blood flow flow in the endometrial zone. Is this reflects the previous slide. Now, this is the very famous apple bomb scoring, what we always talk about. I don't have to go much into detail about this because a lot many more slides to cover. This is one, two, three, four, four is the best. Four is the, there is invasion till the endometrial cavity. Three is little below that. That is the internal endometrial hypoechoic zone. It stops. So it's like that. One is only the myometrium not coming till the endometrium, etc. The four is the best where there is a the lot of blood supply even till the endometrial cavity. So how does it affect implantation? The mechanism by which the thin endometrium may affect implantation is not exactly known because it's a very, very intricate issue. But there are several theories that have been suggested. One is the estrogen receptor abnormality or the dysfunction hypothesis. Second is the oxygen tension theory. And third is the impaired angiogenesis and altered blood flow. Now, this is what I was talking about, the oxygen tension. So this is the functional layer below this, uh, above this arbitrary line that is a functional layer of the endometrium and below that line is the basal layer of the endometrium. So the spiral arteries are with the high oxygenated blood flow there. So there is a lot of spiral arteries with the high oxygenated blood flow here. Now, now the embryo sits there because it's on the functionalist layer, not at the basal layer. So this is the basal layer I was talking about. And these are the spiral arteries with the high oxygenated blood flow, as I was already telling in the previous slide. The oxygen tension normally reduces in the functional and the surface epithelium around the time of implantation. This is normal and this is physiology. But what happens is quality of the functionalist layer is not that thick. So it does not sustain the seeding embryo when the endometrium is thin because of the proximity to the oxygen rich basalis layer that becomes closer to the basal 
basalis layer. The basalis layer is rich in oxygen and that is toxic to the embryo. The embryo is not happy with the high oxygen atmosphere. Less VGEF, that is vascular growth endothelial factor expression and thus poor vascularity. Now, this is about the next theory. The previous was the oxygen theory. Now, this is the impaired angiogenesis theory. This says the uterine and the radial artery, as I've already showed in my figure, the uh, resistance index is increased. The glandular epithelial area and the number of blood vessels are decreased in the thin endometrium group. This just says that the blood, there is impedance of the blood supply and the VGF expression is also altered. Now, the estrogen produces a vasodilatory effect on the uterine arteries, as all of us know. It's been seen that resistance index, pulsatility index of the uterine artery drops with the increasing estradiol level. So we want the resistance to be less. The excessive ovarian androgen can also compromise the estrogen induced endometrial growth. The LH primarily acts on the ovarian stroma to produce androgen. In fact, only a small amount of testosterone is required for the optimum estrogen production. In PCOS, it is a little bit confusing because there is a hyperestrogenic state, but still there is in conditions like PCOS, there's a high LH level that may lead to elevated androgen level, which may be the cause for the poor endometrial development besides the poor egg embryo quality. It is a little bit contradictory to the hyperestrogenic state because there is an increased androgen level also. Now, this is just a tabular or a list of what are all the causes of the thin endometrium. All the different like the Asherman syndrome, clomiphen citrate, especially prolonged use, usually five days of clomiphen and around 50 to 100 milligram of clomiphen and that should suffice. But if used for 150 milligram of clomiphen and then for a many number of days, say that is more than five days, etc. Postpartum infection of the endometrium, septic abortion, pelvic radiation, chemotherapy, diethyl stilbestrol, that is a D D E S therapy in utero, hypothalamic hypogonadism, Mullerian anomalies, premature ovarian insufficiency, hyperandrogenemia like PCOS, genital tuberculosis, sometimes iatrogenic, I'll tell in my further slides what is iatrogenic and idiopathic. So studies of the patients with the thin endometrium often exclude the patients with uterine pathology. Therefore, the true incidence of thin endometrium is not well reported. Now drugs, these are the drugs, the low estrogen level, the use of clomiphene citrate for a prolonged time, that is a low estrogen means not an adequate quantity of estrogen that is supplemented during the HRT cycles. Prolonged use of progesterone again that compacts the endometrium. Then this is the uh, our OC pills. That's a combined estrogen progesterone com combined pills. What we use as a contraceptives or uh, for down regulation. Now causes of thin endometrium. What are the iatrogenic causes? As I was telling in my previous slide, the DNC or a curettage. What we do post abortion. Suppose it's a repeated curettage, or if it's a vigorous curettage, then this may cause the endometrial damage to the basalis layer, the myomectomy, especially when the endometrial cavity is involved the cesarean section, polypectomy, ablation of the endometrium, like previously what we used to do, like TCRE, the radiotherapy, all this can damage the endometrium and that may be so difficult for the endometrium to grow again if the basalis layer is really insulted. Now, the inflammation, what are the different kinds of infection inflammation that can cause permanent scarring of the uterine cavity, tuberculosis, endometritis, STD, PID, etc. Cases of persistent thin endometrium should always be evaluated from the angle of tuberculosis because it is very high, genital tuberculosis is very high in India, especially when the endometrium looks abnormal, when the endometrium looks hypovascular, bald endometrium, thin endometrium not growing, then the hysteroscopic biopsy has to be taken and one, one thinks in terms or one should think in terms of tuberculosis. The permanent damage to the basal endometrium may occur due to severe endometritis or due to the vigorous curettage following abortion, as I was already telling. Probably the curettage incidence has come down after we have got the 
uh, MTP tablets. Sure, severely damaged basal layer, usually leads to cyanicae. That is very bad. Or amenorrhea. Like the cyanicae will cause the uh, impaired vascularity and the cavity is also obliterated. Or even amenorrhea because of assurance. For all practical purposes, completely damaged basal endometrium, which causes amenorrhea, cannot be regenerated. How does it affect implantation? Because the endometrial basalis layer is gone, there is a poor, poor growth of the glandular epithelium. So, VEGF expression is not there. So, again, there is a poor vascular development. So, the, the woman falls in this vicious cycle. There is a high resistance in the radial arteries. The VGF is altered. That does not help the endometrium to grow, etc., etc. What are the other causes? It can be inadequate uterine blood flow for no particular reason. Systemic diseases like hypertension tension, diabetes or smoking. Sometimes it may be really idiopathic. You really don't know why it happened. Maybe because of the intrinsic problem with the endometrial microarchitecture, like the endothelial problems or the uh, high resistance per se in the vessels, etc. Now, congenital Mullerian anomalies also very rarely contribute to the formation of thin endometrium. The association between the congenital Mullerian anomalies and POF with refractory endometrium is documented in some cases. As I was already tell, telling about the selective estrogen receptor modulator, that is tamoxifen. Tamoxifen, unlike CC, causes the increase in the growth of the endometrium that improves the endometrial thickness in patients after natural cycle and even hormone replacement therapy cycles. With CC, adequate follicular recruitment happens, but the endometrium does not grow up to our expectation because of which there is a discrepancy between the ovulation and the pregnancy rate, as all of you know. So such cases, switching on to tamoxifen in subsequent cycles has shown, according to Cassie, there is an improved endometrial proliferation, hyperplasia, and thickness of the endometrium, et cetera, et cetera. The tamoxifen may not be the first line of treatment. I don't use tamoxifen as an ovulation-inducing drug. It's not my first choice of oral ovulogen anyway, but that it causes the adequate thickness of the endometrium, and it may be a promising alternative for those with the thin endometrium also. Uterine cavity assessment by hysteroscopy or sonohistogram is necessary. Uterine assessment may identify patients who may benefit from surgical management. Most studies have not identified endometritis, though it's a very, very common. It's a very subclinical or a subtle entity. So many times it has never come into the forefront as a cause of thin endometrium. So treat endometritis, additions, these are the pathological diseases have to be take, uh, take, uh, treated and to be taken care of as the frontline treatment. Now coming to other than those, what are the rest of the options the woman can avail? So the earlier options were the hormonal adjustment, pentox pentoxifilin, then vitamin E, aspirin, arginine, nitroglycerin, etc. The recently added uh, modali modalities of treatment are the vaginal sildenafil, GCSF, stem cell therapy, making a big round nowadays, endometrial scratch and PRP therapy. So coming to the treatment, this has all the different kinds of treatment, which I mentioned here, the drugs, the surgeries, the latest modes of treatment, everything. Retinyl estradiol, low-dose aspirin, nitric oxide donors, what are they? Let us talk about later. Sildenafil, L-arginine, 6 grams daily, vitamin E, hysteroscopy, if there is any problem, GCSF, that is granulocyte colony stimulating factor, platelet-rich plasma, then the other problems to be treated, sometimes the woman may have to go for surrogacy if the following things don't work like cell, stem cell therapy. There are certain years of no kind of treatment, still a lot of studies to be done on these different kinds of treatment. And ultimately, the uterine transplantation is one of the last options or the surrogacy treatment. Now coming to the endocrine strategies, that is the endocrine kind of treatment, 
is the high dose estradiol what we do as hrt the long course of estradiol vaginal estradiol hcg and gnrh analog this is the endocrine basket of treatment coming to the vitamins and supplements is the low dose aspirin they are all used with the hope of improving the endometrial circulation nitroglycerin not used so often nowadays tocopherol or vitamin e l arginine comes as tablets or sachet pentoxifilin sildenafil these are these all are the vasodilators now coming to the growth factors which improve the growth of the endometrium is granulocyte colony stimulating factor autologous that is the same woman's blood is taken and platelet rich plasma is prepared and used as sub endometrially endometrial stem cell regeneration from bone marrow the surgical treatment would include the hysteroscopic adhesiolysis that is prp I have added here because these are again invasive and uterine transplantation treat the endometrial uh, endometritis very very important because many of the times you may not see this hyperemia or micropolyps it may just look uh, look a bald kind of endometritis when it is a chronic endometritis doxycycline is 100 mg twice daily for 14 days and both partners because you cannot uh, rule out the std or subtle <coughs> stds the intrauterine antibiotics, they haven't come yet be, being still in the study phase. Clear association between the endometrial growth and the circulating estrogen and progesterone level is known. These hormones bind to the intracellular receptors and the resulting proteins upregulate and downregulate the genes which con influence the implantation. To today, the number of drugs and the methods are available to improve the estrogen level in the endometrium and thus increase the supply of the blood to the basal endometrium. The low dose aspirin, there are many studies which say there is a higher implantation and clinical pregnancy rate. The mechanism of low dose aspirin is that it decreases the pulsatility index of the uterine artery and increases the blood flow to the endometrium. It is also one which is an anti inflammatory by inhibiting the prostaglandin synthesis and it makes the subendometrial contractility less. According to Cochrane in 2020, that's the latest one, found no benefit in adding aspirin for endometrial preparation, though we use so traditionally and have been using over so many decades. So there are so many studies which say there is no use of uh, using low-dose aspirin. This study included a large quantity that is around more than 3,000 participants and Wang said that it is absolutely useless using low-dose aspirin. But still we do use micronized low dose aspirin 75 milligram per day and it's been used so so often but there is no randomized travel trial available in literature literature to show that it is worthwhile like there are many studies which say, which say it is not useful but there are other again studies which say that it is not so useful but those which say that it is useful are not of a larger quantity it's a less number of a sample uh, uh, index so the addition of the estrogen is the next one other than the aspirin it's a good uterine blood flow is very very important for the endometrial growth yes all of us know, know this any resistance to the blood flow impairs the growth of the glandular epithelium and results in the decrease in the VEGF which in turn further causes poor flow to the endometrium yes again we know this estrogen produces a vasodilatory effect this is very very important we want the vasodilatory effect so that the VGEF acts synergistically with the estrogen on the uterine arteries and thus helps the endometrial growth. So the resistance index and pulsatility index of the uterine artery drops with increasing estrogen level. Note this point. There is no pregnancy that is seen if the pulsatility index of the uterine artery is more than three. So it has to be less than three for the pregnancy to happen. Most use of most use of oral estradiol 2 milligram BD or TID daily from day two. This is the HRT cycle we are talking about it is used in a step up fashion but many many do use it in a step up fashion like two milligram then four then six etc appropriate and good development of endometrium was seen in 70 to 80 percent of cases when the estrogen was used 
So it can be oral, vaginal, or transdermal use. This oral is up to 12. You can go usually, we use two milligram thrice a day, and that should suffice most of the cases. The transdermal is 17 beta estradiol gel is more efficacious than the oral estrogen, in which enhances the ongoing pregnancy rate and the LBR. This is a slide which has two particular compartments. One is the oral estradiol versus the transdermal the estrogen. So they say under it oral undergoes first pass metabolism that is not the estrogen and there is an increased risk of venous thromboembolism in estrogen oral which is not there with estrogen that is the transdermal preparation. Bioavailability is less here. Bioavailability is better with the transdermal estrogen. So thus higher dose of oral uh, uh, concentration of estrogen is necessary and that may cause some other side effects like gastritis and nausea and that does not happen with the dermal preparation at all so it hardly has any side effects the alternative drugs for the anti-estrogenic effect of clomiphen would be the letrozole or tamoxifen arginine is another drug i am coming into the last few slides of mine please bear with me till then it's an amino acid supplementation that improves the uterine blood flow and how does it act it's basically a nitric oxide precursor and thus it's a donor of nitric oxide what does nitric oxide do we want more of nitric oxide because that causes it relaxes the vascular smooth muscle of the blood vessels in the endometrium and thus causes vasodilatation so there is a reduction of the RI and so there is a it is a inflammatory response also is less and what is a dose it's around six grams per day in divided doses from the first day till we give the trigger it improves the resistance index in 89 that is it reduces the resistance index in 89 that's a huge population of the patients 67 percent that's around two-third developed the endometrium more than 8 mm with the use of oral l arginine again according to takasaki in 2010 this study had a very small population of patients though it was nine patients who showed a thin endometrium in the late follicular phase let's say around day 10 or 11 and the arginine was added as a six gram per day orally if that caused a magic what happened? It improved the endometrial thickness in around 67%. I said it's a small study, but 67% patients out of nine patients, six patients, and also one conceived. So many more trials are needed because this was a very small study. Now coming to the next one, that's a sildenafil, that's a nitric oxide donor. It improves the uterine blood flow again. It's how does it act? Its mechanism of action is by selective inhibitor of cyclic GMP specific phosphodiesterase type 5. So it's an inhibitor of that and that prevents the breakdown of cyclic GMP and it augments the action of the nitric oxide, supplements the nitric oxide on the vascular endothelial smooth muscle and then it causes all that a angiogenesis, relaxation of the endothelial blood vessel, etc. The dose is 25 milligram as a vaginal pessary four times a day till the trigger date. Larger studies are necessary again to confirm its use. It improves the uterine artery blood flow and the endometrial in IV of patients with the prior, if the previous cycle you have used other modalities like estrogen and aspirin, it did not help go for a vaginal sildenafil. Pulsatility index, which ranged between 2 to 3.4, that was higher, that decreased to 1.5 and between 1.5 to 2.7 after one week of sildenafil. And that said that the blood, so blood flow is really increased. The endometrial thickness also developed to more than 10 millimeter after a week's therapy. Significant number of patients also conceived with sildenafil. Coming to the vitamin E or, or tocopherol is 600 milligram per day. That's 200 milligram TID. This is the dose you have to use orally, daily, and that is a statistically significant dose. Endometrial thickness in 52 patients following the treatment showed that when compared to the previous untreated cycle, 72% showed improved uh, vascularity and the, all the resistance index, etc. and 20% consumed. It's, it also acts as an antioxidant and vasodilator. It improves the growth of the glandular epithelium and improves the vascularity and VGF. Coming to the next, these are just touching upon, brushing upon these slides. It's a methyl xanthine derivative of vasodilator and anti-inflammatory agent. 
it is used more by the physicians for the peripheral claudication etc but it reduces the blood viscosity by inhibiting the platelet aggregation so it decreases the local production of tumor necrosis factor doses around 400 mg daily for 5 days and there are lot many studies required yet to prove the pentoxifilin usage this is a combined study of pentoxifilin with the tocopherol at the that was used tocopherol is a potential antioxidant and it scavenges the ros at times of oxidative stress when there is more of ros vitamin e acts as a scavenger so the mechanism of action of pentoxifilin resulting in a better development of endometrium is i have already mentioned this i'm sorry about that when the combination the dose would be 1000 iu of vitamin e and pentoxifilin of 800 mg for about 6 to 9 months that is a longer period has shown that it is used full in radiation induced fibrosis post radiotherapy patients it has really helped that is a combination of these two drugs nitroglycerin patch we hardly use has taken the back seat because it causes vasodilatation the hypotension headache and the swooning effect in the patient so we hardly use that larger studies are required to, which uh, the large controlled clinical studies suggested that the treatment with nitroglycerin patch did not improve the doppler parameters even among the women with a poor uterine perfusion before the treatment similarly the findings were reported when the transdermal 10 mg ntg patch was administered to the pregnant women with impaired uterine perfusion so studies were well done both on non pregnant for the uterine perfusion and the pregnant women to know the uh, uterine perfusion and the doppler studies so what are the other changes is the stop smoking alcohol and watch your bmi Now coming to the granulocyte colony stimulating factor, it's a hemopoietic specific cytokine. It's produced by the tissues like the endothelium, macrophages, and immune cells. Otherwise, also the Nobert Glitcher in 2011 was the first person to use it in four patients with a dramatic improvement in endometrial thickness. Increase there was an improvement in endometrial thickness when the GCSF was used. It increases the endometrial stromal cell deciduous. Stabilization that's mediated through cyclic AMP by apocrine and paracrine action induces proliferation of the endometrium, and there is especially when it is due to the destruction of the subendothelial layer. And where other treatment of vasodilatation have not ha helped, then probably one should think of GCSF. It can be given intrauterine, subcutaneous, intravenous, etc. But if given IV, usually I give subcutaneous. If used as IV, it has to be diluted and only in five percent dextrose and never in saline. That is for GCSF. It's given with one ml insulin syringe six to twelve hours before HCG. It can also be given as the. Uh, it, it comes as a 300 microgram ml per injection it can also be given after the estradiol that is a 12 days of estradiol therapy hcg day itself or the pick up day itself etc its effect appears very dramatically that's in 48 to 72 hours itself the growth spurt in endometrial thickness is really a spurt that is seen because it is seen within few hours that is around 48 to 72 hours so the how does the gcs have thickened the endometrium in such a short time is not known it has a promising future but again needs lot many studies to be done so this is about the three studies that is 1 ml of 30 microgram the 2 to 7 days before the embryo transfer the day of hcg and this is 12 to 13 days or day of the cycle and repeated whatever it is the day of hcg there was a significant higher endometrial thickness that's 85% showed improvement so the day of hcg give one gcsf if you are not happy about the endometrial thickness so the implantation ongoing pregnancy See everything was better during that time because the uh, GCSF was given on the day of HCG injection. So these are the studies which say that the endometrial thickness how it improved with GCSF. That's five point two became nine point three after the use of GCSF. I'll just brush through these slides. Coming to the GnRH agonist, many of us do use GnRH agonist after our FET cycles. Sixty patients were given point M treptoril in what we call as a decapeptil on the day of ovum pickup endometrial transfer. 
and three days after endometrial transfer. So there were the three different studies. Another 60 patients were served as the control group. So 60 patients were given any of these days and 60 patients were not given anything. So there was a significant increase in the uh, uh, endometrial thickness and the pregnancy rate in the study group because of the tryptorelin. HCG priming. HCG is very, very important as one of the treatment for thin endometrium because the HCG receptors are present in the endometrium, but the expression of the functional receptors is regulated by the cyclical changes in the endometrium. Endometrial priming for seven days in the proliferative phase with estrogen in FET cycles is really promising according to many studies. The dose would be 150 units of SCG from day 8 till day 14, a week's time, along with the estrogen in FET and the donor egg cycles. So it is the SCG for a week in the uh, around day 8 to day 14. This is HCG with the studies with HCG with agonist. That is, the, these are all the different modalities of treatment and that showed the beneficial effect. Platelet-rich plasma also had a lot of improvement in patients with thin endometrium, especially those who suffered Usherman syndrome, according to so many studies, which I have mentioned here. Preliminary studies are promising for a population which has a poor prognosis and when they had few options for treatment. Now, PRP is collected from the autologous blood, that is the woman's blood, from its venous sample, and then the intrauterine transfusion is done. It was carried out in five women with a refractory thin endometrium. They were infused with 0.5 ml of autologous PRP, that's a platelet-rich plasma, in the uterine cavity on day 9 or 10, and again later, that is, sorry, 13 and 14 of the cycle, while these women were on oral estradiol valerate. That is it, uh, the PRP was done while the woman is on estradiol valerate. There was satisfactory growth of the endometrium in all in the five with the four live births and one is missed abortion. That means all of them conceived. There was another study by Sharazad. He said a similar pilot on 10 patients and five were pregnant with four live births. So in comparison to GCSF, PRP is more accessible and affordable because one doesn't have to spend on the drug. The minimum risk of transmission of infectious disease is because it's an autologous blood sample that is taken. It's autologous plasma that's been enriched with the platelets at about four times more than the circulating blood. It contains several factors like VGF and different kinds of growth factors. They regulate the cell migration and they promote the endometrial proliferation because of the VGF and different growth factors. Coming to the last few slides, that's the endometrial scratch. It induces decidualization of the endometrium. It releases cytokine, causes a kind of inflammation. The injury causes inflammation and a lot of cytokines are there produced. And healing of this inflammation problem is very important for implantation. So when we should do this, it should be done in the luteal phase of the cycle preceding the actual treatment cycle. That's around seven days prior to the onset of menstruation. Probably you can do this even in your IUI cycles, not only at the IVF cycles. Studies have shown that if done in the follicular phase of the index cycle, there is no benefit. So it has to be done, say, on day 23 of the cycle, of the previous cycle rather. Only the superficial layer is scratched. That is just at the posterior upper aspect of the endometrium that is scratched by few strokes and that should be enough. Now, role of stem cell therapy. This is the latest kit on the block. The adult bone marrow is a known reservoir of the stem and the progenitor cells. As all of us know that the stem cells are pluripotent and we can use it anywhere where we want. So the role of bone marrow derived stem cells in the reconstitution of the human endometrium has been demonstrated by different groups of investigators. They showed that the bone marrow derived stem cells are recruited in response to the injury and they're involved in the endometrial regeneration as these cells proved to have a high regenerative capacity. Not only endometrium, they are used in, there is a lot many indications for the stem cells because they are the progenitor cells. The regenerative potential of these cells was studied further in animal modes with assurance and refractory thin endometrial cases. 
So there is a case series from so many people. There are so many studies. They say it's invasive and it is expensive. It seems to be very promising also, especially in refractory cases. It may become an alternative to surrogacy because your GCSF, your aspirin, the pentoxifilin, nothing has helped. Even if the PRP is not helped, if you think of surrogacy or uterine transplantation, transplantation think of stem cells because there is something before that. So so it is alternative to surrogacy in many patients, although the studies done are still very, very preliminary and a lot of studies are required. The first human use of autologous endometrial angiogenic stem cells in a patient with Ashermans was successful in 2011 by Chaitanya Nagori. Recently, a human pilot trial that is Santa Maria and Polix infused the bone marrow derived stem cells in the spiral arterioles in 11 patients with Ashermans, resulting in the increase in the thickness of the endometrium, not only that, even the subsequent pregnancies. But there is a line of warning here. According to Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society guidelines, they say that in patients with thin endometrium undergoing embryo transfer cycles, they suggest against, I have underlined that, against the use of aspirin, vaginal sildenafil, GCS, pentoxifilin, and whatnot. So they say even PRP does not help, even stem cells rather. So the quality of evidence is weak. This is what they say. So these are the empirical treatments like heparin, corticosteroids, IVIG, and intralipid. This is just to complete the list because there are a lot many studies that are awaiting and the report is yet to be out. Now there are, uh, there are certain which are out of our spectrum or out of our basket is certain things is just to complete the last two slides probably that's acupuncture, then the neuromuscular electrical stimulation studies of the endometrium, etc. According to a preliminary report, it said that it may improve the endometrial growth in patients with thin endometrium during FET cycles, electroacupuncture, etc. There is thin endometrial in non-IVF cycles, one has to think of this also. It's not only the endometrium, thin endometrium comes into limelight with the backdrop IVF. No, it is even in non-IVF cycles, one has to think of because even if the woman is trying for a natural pregnancy, the endometrium is very thin, then the, there's a very low pregnancy rate when the endometrium is the thin, which we have already mentioned. Absolute pregnancy and live birth rate are also much lower with ovarian stimulation IUI compared with IVF, which may account for the lack of effect. What I want to say here before the IVF is that the natural pregnancy may be difficult. And even if the woman has conceived, the problems secondary to the thin endometrium because of a low vascularity, like the low birth weight or IUGR, perinatal morbidity and mortality may be much more. So this is to conclude after my marathon session is I would like to give certain important points just to conceptualize is optimal endometrial thickness is very, very necessary for successful implantation. And as an IVF specialist or a fertility specialist, one has to gear himself or herself to reach this important aspect. Though there are many treatment options, as I have already mentioned, the clinician should make the decision on his previous clinical experience, come what may. There are so many studies each day. You may be getting each journal telling so many other aspects, but remember your past experience and work on that sense. Treatment of the primary cause is very, very important. I cannot just give her low dose aspirin or the estrogen or pentoxifilin, never looking at her endometrium or never bothering about what is happening inside the uterine cavity. Adjuvants need high quality evidence by being used in large number of trials. Every day, new adjuvant is coming to develop the thin endometrium to convert to thick endometrium or a fluffy, nice, healthy endometrium. But all these adjuvants need a lot of trials to undergo. Yeah, and that is the end of my slide. Sorry for taking a lot of time. Sorry for keeping you hooked to my slides, my presentation on this evening, and I conclude here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to all the participants who are watching here. Thank you, Shield Pharma, for giving me the opportunity, and I conclude my talk here.
thank you so much ma'am and uh, you are not to be so sorry uh, it was very uh, vast topic and you covered it within uh, one hour and we got lots of thank information you. regarding this uh, topic and uh, so let us see uh, if we have any queries in the comment section yeah So, ma'am, uh, one question is that uh, what is your view on PRP treatment for uh, endometrium thinning? Uh, see, I have not used PRP in my patients personally because uh, um, I have got good results with other kind of treatment like uh, the pre IVF hysteroscopy, then the low dose aspirin, the endometrial scratch, the good dose of estrogen what we use with all these kinds of treatment. I never got into such a situation where the endometrium was so, so refractory that it had, the woman had to be subjected to PRP. But at the same time, I have interacted with many people and mm -hmm. come to know about their experience on PRP and according to them though the studies are very very small one center has done study on 10 people one study has done on around 24 people etc but they say that the result is very encouraging but I'm extremely sorry to say that I do not have a personal experience on my patients because having so many other drugs uh, somewhere across the line, I got good result with my good, beautiful endometrium. So uh, it never came such a situation that I had to subject my woman for this PRP. But anyway, it may be in future, I may have to do some studies on this. Thank you ma'am for giving this uh, information. Then uh, one uh, normal question is that uh, does endometrium thinning can uh, increase the weight of the patient, like weight gain? No, no, not at all. No way related. So, and uh, any diet recommendation according to you, ma'am, for this uh, issue? And no particular diet because that does not reach till the endometrium, right? It is only that uh, the smoking or the lifestyle modifications and the diet and weight probably because they are interrelated, one has to take care of their BMI, etc. But there is no particular, particular food that gives a vasodilatory effect on the endometrium because it does not reach there. So I cannot see any more questions and thank you so much for giving all this information and we would like to have more sessions with you in future ma'am and I also thank yeah. participants to join for today's session. Thank you so much ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, it was a bit lengthy because I was supposed to no, speak no, both on beautiful. thin endometrium in the non-fertile and thin endometrium in the fertile and all treatment yes. aspects, etc. etc. So yes, that sir, took all, more time of yours. Covered. Yes, ma'am. Fine. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, Bye. thank you. Bye-bye.